Uh, this goes back about uh, two years in time. I was in a, a, a quite a large tanker and we were transiting the, the Straits of Hormuz, which is one of the busiest waterways in the world. And this was a huge tanker. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning and I was observing this officer on watch. He was, he was, uh, into, uh, he was keeping a navigation watch. And uh, during the watch, I observed that he spent something like 70% of his time just filling in paper records. So out of curiosity, I just asked him that, what is the need for you to do that? Shouldn't you be keeping a watch? Because it's so busy, uh, there's so much traffic around you. So uh, he responded to me by saying uh, that um, the reason he has to keep uh, a, a paper record is that there is a navigational audit uh, waiting in the next port. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is interesting because the purpose of the navigation audit is to make sure that uh, you're following all the processes to make sure that the ship is safe. And clearly, by spending 70% of your time just keeping a record of all the activities, you are putting the ship at danger. And what that means, basically what that means to me is that the, the process has, been, has become so disconnected from its intent. So something is, is not right here. Uh, accidents are happening not because we have, um, uh, or we are not following the procedures. Accidents are happening because we have too many procedures. And I thought, wow, this would be an interesting topic to explore further. And the more I talked about it, the more I felt this is becoming a deep rooted problem across safety critical industries. So I thought i speak to Greg and see Greg Smith uh, and see what he thinks about it. And I'm so glad that we, we both found this opportunity to get together to raise awareness on this important topic. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, in India, actually, we keep it very simple. We just say namaste and that takes care of everything. Um, so welcome to this uh, first LinkedIn live event with myself and, and Greg. Um, uh, very grateful to you that you've taken the time to join us. Um, so. Myself, I am uh, just a very light introduction. My name is Nepin. I host the podcast Embracing Differences. You probably have seen me on LinkedIn. I'm quite active on LinkedIn. I am the founder of Novella Solutions, but also a former seafarer. I used to work on deep sea ships. Um, and where I got interested in this idea of, of bureaucracy, and, 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 and I, I found my way into to, to higher studies. I did a master's um, in economics and a PhD in social sciences and anthropology. And um, I have an interest in safety management systems and particularly accident investigations and incident reporting systems uh, in the way we use and abuse the system both in, in, in safety critical industries. And I'm joined by <coughs> Greg Smith, who probably doesn't need too much of an introduction, but I let him speak a few words about himself. Um, Greg, would you like to introduce your son? Thanks, Nipun. I just, sorry, I just had to scare my son off. He came and poked his head in. Um, I'm a lawyer from Australia, um, probably best known in the safety community for my most recent book, which is the, I, know, I think that's in reverse, but that's Paper Safe. Um, and I've been a lawyer, but in and out of the health and safety industry uh, for the best part of 30 years now. Um, and I became interested in this idea of um, of bureaucracy from the initially from a legal perspective um, in having to deal with so many clients documented systems that were so unhelpful when it came to managing legal risk um, after an event and that that's really the the driver behind it but I'll share more about that um, once I get into my little sort of part of the presentation later but thanks, Nip, and thanks, thanks very thanks, much Greg. for the invite. Uh, yes, uh, it's an odd hour for you, so very thankful to you for joining me. Um, so we have uh, what the way we formatted it is that I'll do a fifteen minutes presentation and no more, uh, and then I will hand in to Greg, uh, and then uh, towards the last twenty to twenty five minutes, we will take time uh, answering any questions that you have. Um, I mean, we make no claim that we are experts; uh, we are learning as much as you are. So we may not have answers to your questions, but together at least we can, we can try and understand the problem better. It's not a, a kind of problem that's gonna go away after this presentation, uh, but at least we'll have a better awareness. And the fact that there were at least a good 850 people who signed up to the LinkedIn event shows you that, that uh, 
there is a recognition at least that there is an issue here. Um, so um, I will talk about this idea of meaningful compliance uh, purely from a business and safety perspective. Uh, with a background in auditing for almost six to seven years, uh, I find it uh, a very relevant topic and, and an area of interest uh, uh, that has kept me hooked on to this topic for many years now. And the way I will present it is I will talk about uh, three things. Uh, I will talk about the, so before I did, I just wanted to, sh the, the, when, we, when we put this event out on, on social media, we had lots of responses, lots of comments. And I just want to start off with that because that kind of helps us to put things in perspective. Um, so here's one from Richard, uh, Richard Brooks. Uh, and he says, it would be good to discuss getting compliance from bureaucracy back to something that is meaningful. For me, that means that it is at least an attempt to have paperwork aligned to work as done. There is so much work as imagined bureaucracy such as ISOs, internal audits, uh, customer audits, free qualification assessments, bid tenders, blah, blah, blah. When you start playing buzzwords, bingo with ISO auditors and leaving something for them to find, it's just gone too far. I see so much paperwork driven by supply chains that contractors then have to complete it and it needs to be in 80 different flavors to win work. As somebody who, who, who does uh, have an interest in research, I think this, is, this could be at least three or five, four different topics on their own. But we try and expand on this as we go as much as we can. The other thing I found interesting was a checklist, and this comes from Dimitrios, uh, says checklists on an aid memoir, they are not the procedure itself. And importantly, they are to be used by professional and competent people. So we need to stop mass producing checklists that are for toddlers. And for that, we need to understand the problem in education. I think it captures the essence of this, of this session really well. So in the next... Uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, what I'm going to do is I will talk about the how, the why, and the what of meaningful compliance. So what that means is that we will talk about how the process has become disconnected from its intended purpose, um, why has it become disconnected, and purely from a, a safety and, and organizational learning and business perspective, what can we do differently from what we are doing right now? And then obviously I'll hand it to, to Greg. He will talk about the, the legal side of things. Um, so let's start with the how. How has the process become disconnected with practice? And what I have here is not a good or bad example, but just an average example of a checklist that we use in the maritime oil and gas sector. Um, and this is a checklist uh, on board, which is used on board a ship. Uh, and the purpose of the checklist, this is important, the purpose of the checklist is to ensure that a ship is ready to depart from port, making sure that all navigation equipment is working as intended. So that's really the purpose of the checklist. Now, you may come from other industries and, and straight away disqualify it as something which is very premature and, and, and not well developed or not well, well understood. Nevertheless, the principles of what I'm gonna talk about are not drastically different. They, we, we see these problems everywhere. And let me start by saying that this is not a problem of engaging with the worker, trying to have conversation with the end, end, end user and trying to come up with more meaningful checklists or, or putting action verbs into checks. I think the problem is much more complicated than that. So uh, just to be a little bit more specific, let's start to look at the details of the checklist. It says, complete all sections with a takeoff are not applicable which I find very interesting. So it gives you no room for discretion at all. You either say that the check has been ticked or you put a not applicable to it, which is not very helpful. If you look at an example like uh, navigation lights, so what does that mean? Or binoculars or window wipers or anything for that matter. Takeoff means what? Is the equipment functional or is it, is it merely present on the bridge of the ship? They're two very different things. And what do you do when the, the thing is not working? How do you address the problem? How do you raise this concern? That's, a, that's, that's quite interesting. The other thing I find interesting is that the risk assessment and toolbox talk, as you look down below, risk assessment carried out and toolbox talk done. Now, if the checklist goes to the details of, of looking into binoculars and window wipers and everything else on the bridge, why do you need a risk assessment? 
thinking about it. So the reason you need a risk assessment is, uh, as Professor Michael Power would call, this document has become the risk management of everything. So it tries to manage the risk of, of operations, which is reminding people to do their checks. But at the same time, there might be a contractual obligation to put this risk assessment inside. There might be a, a requirement that comes from a contractor or a subcontractor for a temporary period of time. So you put that check in to, to, to oblige that contractor, but you never actually take it off, as Richard also pointed out in the beginning. And then this, um, towards the end, it says uh, checked by and checked and confirmed by. So the checklist is very firm on, on having somebody to sign it so that in the event that something is not working and you have ticked it off, you are then held to account. So the checklist becomes an instrument to manage many, many different things of which the intended purpose, which is to, to prepare the ship for departure, becomes disconnected from the checklist, completely disconnected. And this is exactly what happens in, in many process documents, documented processes. The process becomes disconnected from its intended purpose, whether it's risk assessment, whether it's near -miss reporting system, whether it's, whether it's a, uh, uh, internal audits or external audit, it becomes disconnected. So that's the how bit. Now let's talk about the why. Why does that disconnect exist? And this is again something that I've spent some years thinking about this problem, that why do we have the disconnect between process and purpose? So let's take a simple example. In many organizations, we have what we call near-miss reporting systems, hazard reporting systems. And typically, uh, this is a very common pattern that we see in, 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 in reporting systems, incident reporting system, that somebody reports a problem and then you've got to respond to it. And the purpose is that we want to find out from the workers, we want to engage with the workers, we want to find out their concerns and we try to fix those issues, try to, to resolve those issues. So that's really the purpose of the system. But as you can see here, there are many issues within, even in this very dull and mundane, uh, little, very little discussion. So during deck rounds, I noticed the manhole cover was left open after tank inspection. I closed the cover and reported to the supervisor. Um, this is what the worker says. And, and the immediate response is, good job. Now check the permit to work system is signed off and closed. Inform the supervisor not to leave the manhole cover open at the end of the day's work. Isn't that fascinating? And there is at least three or four things I would like to highlight here, just looking at it. One is this, this anxiety, this anxiety to control everything, to put an end to the problem, even before we try and understand it. So you've seen something, now, now just go and, and take this action and we'll all be fine. And often driven by fear, irrational behavior. Then we have, this idea of trying to find simple solutions. So simple solutions for a simple world. So somebody found a manhole cover left open. Uh, the idea is to go back and tell that person, you should never do it again and inform the supervisor and just close it off. Uh, so this, uh, you have a problem and here's a solution, go and fix it and you'll be fine. So this is another reason because we approach every problem as if we have a solution to it without really engaging with the problem. Auditability, which is a term again comes from Professor Michael Power, uh, is too much focus on controlling the controls. So the whole purpose of the audit, because you cannot engage with this person, you have no idea what is happening on the front line, what sort of issues this person is facing. The easiest thing is to just close this thing because you know there's an audit coming up. And that's the first thing that the auditor would be interested in, whether this near miss or hazard report or, 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 or risk assessment has been closed within the, the permitted time. So that's the auditability. Because we cannot engage with the problem, we cannot comprehend the problem, it's too much for us, let's just focus on controlling the process. Again, that this can, and I will show you the, 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 the other side of the story to help you understand how the process is disconnected from it. And finally, uh, in most organizations, this idea that there are just a very few people who sit 
in the in the safety department in the learning department and and in the technical department and 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 quite high up um, and would have answers to all the problem so if you listen to them nothing will go wrong so deference to authority so these are some of the reasons obviously there's many more but this is i thought this will be the something that we can we can think about uh, in a more focused way anxiety simple solutions auditability and deference to authority leads to this idea of the disconnect between process and purpose and then the final thing which is this that so what can we do about it and this is something that greg and i have been thinking about for for quite some time now and this idea that compliance in itself is not a dirty word as as some would project it i think the idea is that compliance has no direction and to give compliance some sort of direction some sort of meaning some sort of purpose uh, could be a starting point to make compliance more more meaningful to the business and for the well-being of the people so how do we do that so uh, i just put back the same example that we i showed earlier so similar thing on the left hand side that's one way of dealing with the problem and on the right hand side you try to engage with the problem and there's no reason why we cannot do that in this hyper connected world today if we have the will to do it so somebody reports a problem the first thing is not to give them a solution the first thing is to actually understand the problem and trying to get to the person to the that competent person who who was who was engaged in this in this activity and then asking the question not controlling the person not controlling the purpose the the process but actually trying to support the person so i think that is important which is something which is missing in 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 the safety world today so couple of things or at least four things i would like you to take away uh, at least from a, from a business and of safety performance perspective one is that turn this idea of trying to control every process every person you have employed competent people our job now is to define the function and support the function if the function is all about navigating the ship as quickly as possible from the port and making sure that nobody forgets to carry out the critical te- risk uh, tests then making sure that the function is supported by the by the documented procedures by the competence of the people that's one that's the that's the to me that is the most important thing turning it away from from uh, from controlling to supporting the function understanding the problem trying to engage with the problem rather than just coming up with simple solutions Uh, understanding that there is no such thing like uh, good and bad uh, compliance and non compliance yes and no when it comes to understanding controlling verifying the risks and to really have those dialogues and discussions where those trade offs and compromises come up during discussions and then bringing authority a little bit closer to expertise we do so many audits inspections investigations and and we send people who think that they know everything even before they have understood the problem creating that equation between authority which is people who have the authority to change things and between expertise people who have the know how is is one possible way to 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 create this idea of a meaningful compliance which is aligning process with purpose and uh, that's how we make bureaucracy uh, serve its intended purpose and that's uh, that's all from me greg okay thanks nipin i'm going to share my screen start that. So I really want to talk about this topic. Um it, it's going to start as a conversation about my perspectives on it from as a legal concern. And to some extent those legal concerns are um very much within an Australian legislative jurisdictional context, but I'm going to share um examples from around the world as well, which I hope will help illustrate the pervasiveness of this problem um and why it is really something i think we need to pay attention to because i think it's gone this issue of bureaucracy this issue of paper systems has gone beyond simply creating problems um in the context of legal proceedings and i think there are more and more examples where the process and then the documented systems themselves um have actively undermined safety so in other words our process of creating paperwork and the bureaucratization of paperwork and the disconnect 
of purpose and process um, has actually resulted or at least significantly contributed to less safe workplaces. And I think there's an interesting conversation we have to have as a profession um, about, you know, what do we replace it with? What do we replace checklists or what do we replace some of these processes with? Um, and there's an interesting argument if you ever, there's a, a podcast called The Safety of Work um, run by two Australian academics, um, doc, Dr. Drew Ray and Dr. Dave Proven. Um, and this question often comes up in the context of injury rate. You know, if, if, we, if we can't rely on lost time injury rates as a measure of safety, you know, which I don't think we're certain that we can't, what do we replace it with? You know, is it better to have a bad metric than no metric at all? And I'm very much in the camp, you're better off having no metric than a bad metric. The bad metric creates problems. In the same way, I think you're better off having no paperwork than having bad paperwork, because I think the bad paperwork creates problems. So I want to start this conversation really from a, a legal risk management perspective. This is a New South Wales District uh, Criminal Court of Appeal case, I should say. Um, those services, it involved a young, um, a young worker who was badly injured in a welding incident. Um, a flash um, burns to his eyes and face. Um, the organisation, as is described there by the court, had this vast range of induction and supervision, supervising protocols. So they had all the processes, they had everything in place. But rather than be able to turn to the court and say, you know, Your Honour, here's our detailed processes, this is everything that we have in place, you should take this into account. Um, this is our mitigating circumstances, this is our defence, the court said, look, it's certainly not a defence and far from being a mitigating circumstance, what it actually does is reinforce the extent to which you, did not put, you didn't put your systems into place. And I think we see that time and time again with organisations um, once they get caught up in legal proceedings. The documented processes don't serve to help the organisation. The documented processes simply demonstrate how little we actually did in practice compared to what we said we were going to do in writing. So straight off the bat, they create that very much upfront problem for us. Um, similarly, this was a decision, 2019 New South Wales District Court decision that talked about safety documentation. And this was an interesting one because this was a case that involved a fatality in a quarry um, and ultimately, the company was found not guilty of breaching its obligations. Even though the safety systems were not very good, they weren't well written, the evidence of all of the witnesses clearly explained what the hazards were and how they were meant to be managed. And the, the ability of the witnesses to get in a witness box and clearly articulate the risks and the management controls was actually more important than the documented systems. But the court makes the interesting observation that all of this documentation isn't much use um, unless workers are trained and the processes are followed and enforced. And I'm not sure that as a, as a, as a profession, health and safety spends enough time um, on making sure our processes are understood, implemented and effective. We spend, I think, too much time on the development of systems and really arguing over very fine points in documents and processes which ultimately add very little value to the day-to-day -day management of safety. Similarly, we see a case like this. This is a South Australian prosecution, Supreme Court prosecution, um, in a construction industry where a worker was killed when they were hit in the head by a steel I-beam that slipped. And you see from the outset all of the standard, particularly in an Australian context, and I from what I understand in many other contexts, the standard approach to managing the risk, you've got you know, daily pre-start meetings, um, job safety analysis or some other form of team risk assessment, a star card, which is like your individual risk assessment. But this observation by the court that these processes had all devolved into a tick and flick exercise. And I think that's probably one of the great markers we, we have or one of the great concerns we should have in our paperwork whereby we're just going through the motions of completing the paperwork because the paperwork has to be completed before the work can commence as opposed to a genuine 
engagement and conversation about the understanding of risk or achieving the outcome that the documentation is, is designed to achieve. And that's a common theme through, through many of these matters that we have to deal with. So again, uh, coroner's inquest um, involved in investigation. This was a fatality when a worker was killed when a load fell off a truck. And you see that last line there, this idea of um, the observation in the coroner's court that we create all these documents, they'll pass our audit requirements, but at the end of the day, workers in the field find the documents hard to comprehend and of limited relevance to their daily activities. And I think, I think right there is a is a fundamental executive management obligation. It's not a health and safety obligation. This is an obligation of the management with responsibility for the business and responsibility for the workers to understand the extent to which our workforce comprehend or understand our expectations and processes and whether those processes that we describe are actually relevant to what the workers have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you take, for example, Nip Nippon's checklist that he showed before, um, there's probably a genuine question about how relevant a checklist like that is in that industry at that time on a day-to-day -day basis, or is it just something that we have to do to be able to get on with our lives? Um, again, similarly, from a, taking the checklist example, this is from a fatality um, in a rail operation. And you get this, this is a, a checklist that was designed um, to check the oper operability of a piece of equipment. But you get this observation that the, the crew members said that complete adherence to the checklist was time consuming. So they do a, a random crew member would do a cursory check and then the whole thing would be marked to indicate compliance. And again, you get this, this repeated observation about it being a tick and flick process. And here we see those observations that take it a bit further. So not only was this a tick and flick process, which was just a case of poor compliance, it actually um, undermined or eroded the assurance it was intended to provide. So instead of providing the assurance um, that this equipment was safe to use, what it does is it creates um, a false impression that the equipment is safe to be used because these checklists are all being produced. And I think here we start to run into the idea of, well, how do we test this, um, this notion of bureaucracy? And I think, I think part of the, the testing here is to say, well, um, if, if this checklist is not important enough for the organisation to invest time, effort and energy into understanding whether it's done properly and whether it's achieving the outcomes it was designed to achieve, then do we really need the checklist? Because if we're not going to invest the time and energy to understand if it works, do we actually need it? And I think, perhaps wearing a lawyer's hat, I think if you're not going to understand the efficacy of the process, if you're just going to hang it out there and not, as I say, invest the time, effort and energy, in a lot of ways you're probably better off without the documented process. That's, and that's interesting. So you get this same observation of, not having time to complete it, tick and flick process, undermining assurance. That's in an Australian context, but you see then something like the BP Texas City refinery explosion um, and the report into that, where you know the functionality check of alarms and instruments was required prior to startup. Um, and those of you not familiar with this particular disaster should appreciate that those instruments, um, alarms and in instruments and the ability to monitor the presence of hydrocarbons in the raffinate splitter tower was quite a critical um, failure point in this disaster. But then you get this observation that the technicians had begun checking those critical alarms, but they were told there wasn't time, we're about to start up. Some were tested, most weren't, but it's initialed and signed off that those checks have been completed. And I think it, it's probably and ought to be a genuine concern in many industries and many businesses about the extent to which we rely on these processes to give us comfort that people either understand risk or processes are effective and ready to go, um, as opposed to, again, just this mindless exercise in completing paperwork. Um, sim from the similar sort of report, we get this observation. So this is the independent review. So um, BT, BT Texas City 
a BP, sorry, Texas City disaster occurred. There was a chemical safety board investigation into the technical nature of the disaster. There was an independent review commission that looked at all of BP's refineries in North America. And one of the observations they made was that the corporate initiatives, um, the corporate health and safety initiatives overloaded personnel at the refineries to the possible detriment of process safety. So this is this observation that we're putting um, so many safety initiatives into our organisation that our managers and our workers haven't got either the resources or the capacity to, um, to prioritise them, to implement them. And I think the subtext in all of this is, well, it just goes by the wayside. You know, we've been flooded with so many initiatives um, that we can't realistically implement any of them effectively. And so you really start to distract the organisation from the critical things that matter. And again, that's a reasonably common theme. Um, you know, it starts as early as the Chernobyl disaster where we talk about the poor quality of operating procedures and their conflicting character put a heavy burden on the operating crew. So straight away, there's this risk. Um, you know, we're creating documents. If you go back to the um, Queensland coroner's case, we're creating documents that people don't understand. They're not relevant. They're creating burden. They're overloading our people. And all of a sudden, all of the objectives we're trying to achieve in safety almost get overwhelmed by the number of things that we do in the name of safety. And I think one of the dangers is that safety itself starts to become a source of harm because we're not genuinely taking the time and effort to invest in ensuring that what we ask our workforce to do is something that can be properly delivered and that the outcomes we're asking our processes to deliver are being achieved. Um, Montara, this was an offshore incident um, northwest of Australia that talks about a document, the safety documents being replete with Delphic motherhood statements. Nobody actually understood what the requirements were. We get something like the SO Longford gas plant inquiry. This is another Royal Commission that talked about the system being a world-class system and complying with world's best practice. Um, but this idea that the system's defective if it's not effectively implemented and the system must be capable of being understood by those expected to implement it. It's a complex system, language is impenetrable, um, characteristics made the system difficult to comprehend. But you get this observation at the end that the Commission gained the distinct, distinct impression that there was a tendency for the operation of the system to take on a life of its own divorced from operations in the field and that development and maintenance of the system diverted attention from what was actually happening in the practical functionings of the plant. And I wonder how real this is in many organisations when the time and effort that is devoted to safety is devoted to safety administration, either developing or counting or administratively checking our processes as opposed to ensuring that our processes are achieving the, and I keep coming back to this and I don't apologise for it, the extent to which our processes are achieving the outcomes they're designed to achieve. And it's no, no good running a three-hour induction program if people walk out of the induction program none the wiser about what the hazards in their workplace are and what the expectations on them are. If it's not achieving that outcome, you've probably just wasted three hours of everybody's life. Um, again, we get something like the Pike River Royal Commission in New Zealand, underground coal mine explosion that killed 29 men that said the number and length of the documents posed a challenge to the credibility of the system. And again, that's just a very polite way of saying nobody could read or understand all this rubbish. So uh, it, it's this overwhelming theme that we see um, in case law, in inquiries, up to and including major accident inquiries. Again, taken from the Pike River Royal Commission, you have statistical information was mainly around personal injury data, but that's not much help in assessing the risks of catastrophic events faced by high hazard industries. Um, nothing new there, known that for decades. But this idea that the board appears to have received no information proving the effectiveness of crucial systems. So what is it about our processes that gives us that insight into our effectiveness of crucial systems? Again, many of our checklists, 
many of our indicators simply don't inform us um, about what we need to be informed of. And the last one I want to point out, and I think this is something we ought to take note of, this sort of global pandemic we have of mental health issues. Um, in Australia, over the last few years, there has been a number of inquiries into the high suicide rates of fly-in, fly-out workers, um, that fly-in, fly-out mine site workers. Um, and I expect we'll probably see something similar develop in the construction industry. Now, both of those industries have um, demographics that are prone, prone to higher suicide rates, so young men um, in particular, unfortunately, fit that demographic. But this Lifeline report, which was quite interesting to my mind, identified that one of the contributors to poor mental well-being in these workplaces was the number and the adherence to site safety rules, um, a sense of intimidation, um, and you see there these, these rules that are, in theory, designed to care for workers but lead to inflexible regulation over genuine safety concerns. And I think that's a real thing. Um, we seem to have gotten to a position where we say if it's a rule or if it's a, a process, then that represents the engagement with the genuine safety concern and that's what you do and whatever genuine concerns you have outside of that to sort of fade away but the safety rules created stress they undermined the participants ability to fill job to fill their jobs left them feeling insecure and and so we go we go through this whole spectrum i think of safety bureaucracy and i, I define safety bureaucracy in my book as that disconnect between process and purpose and we get that whole um, spectrum of issues from technical black letter law uh, problems in prosecutions um, all the way through to uh, you know, and, and complex processes actually undermining our ability to have safe workplaces all the way through to our processes actively causing harm. And I think this is the great challenge for the health and safety industry in this issue of bureaucracy is how do we create systems of work, um, systems of information exchange, learning systems, sharing systems in a way that ensures people understand the expectations, understand the hazards, um, understand how those hazards are meant to be controlled and creates an environment within which people can effectively operate um, without creating what I see is really quite significant problems um, across most industries in most jurisdictions. So that's, that's a very whirlwind tour. Um, Nippon and I have put together a, quite an extensive program that we're going to be running in a few weeks um, over a series of webinars and seminars and training programs, looking at this in much more detail and um, looking at some of the solutions and the way through. But we thought it was really important to just engage with the safety community about um, a lot of these issues and just share some of our preliminary views and ideas and particularly start framing up what the problem looks like. 